Yowie wowie, everyone. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the Virtual Makers Showcase. I'm so excited about this session. I've waited a really long time for this one, and I can't uh, wait to see what surprises our wonderful makers from the Americas have today. Um, <clears throat> I just want to give, well, I'll wait just a moment, that way everybody can get in, and then I'll give my special thanks, and I'll introduce all our makers, and then I'll show you guys a little bit of uh, what uh, they're working on right now. So give us just one minute. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get this started then. Um, here I am again. I'm your host, Nicholas, also known as Ocarina Owl. Thank you for coming to Concert One. We had a lot of fun watching our performers. Uh, be sure to support them on their appropriate and respectful social media. Um, so today we have three wonderful makers from the Americas today, two from the U.S. and one from Canada. And we're very, very excited for you guys to be able to meet them, know what they're about, know what their ocarinas are about, and just have a really good chance and a good time enjoying getting to know your makers. You might own some of these uh, ocarinas from these makers, which is awesome, uh, or you might not know about them, which gives you an opportunity to purchase an ocarina from them. Uh, and I'll be posting a few special discount codes after the session. Um, I have a uh, really cool uh, special discount codes from all the makers that you'll see today. So uh, usually this panel uh, would be done in person and you would be able to try out their ocarinas. But today they're kind of just going to share their story. They're going to tell you a little bit about what uh, inspired them to make them ocarina, to make ocarinas uh, and what products they have available uh, right now on their respective websites, how you can order one from them and like also, they uh, will do a few sound samples of what their ocarinas sound like. <clears throat> so if you're one of the makers, I just want to make sure that you have these settings enabled. That way, whenever you're doing your uh, uh, show of your ocarina, it sounds to the best quality. So if you're looking at your Zoom settings on your preferences, uh, please be sure whenever you're using your uh, audio settings, go to audio. Um, go to uh, automatically adjust microphone volume, and it should be checked by default. Uncheck that, please, if you can. Also, if you go to advanced in the settings, be sure that you uh, click the option to show in meeting option to enable original sound for the microphone. Also, if you're performing on the open mic night to all participants, this might be helpful to know too. Um, if you're using audio processing, click disable to persistent, uh, to suppress persistent background noise, and also click disable to suppress intermittent background noise. This will give your ocarina when you're playing it, uh, just a natural um, audio on the Zoom call, if that makes sense. So with those uh, settings in place, if you need me to repeat that, uh, feel free to send me a message. I'm going to go ahead and tell you the order and the makers that we have today. Today, first up, we'll have Ocarina Caro, which is a maker from Canada. We're so excited to have her. Then we'll, after that, we'll hear a little bit from SDL Ocarina, which is a maker from St. Louis, uh, from the U.S. Uh, and finally, we'll end our session with Songbird Ocarina today, which is a maker from California in the United States. And we're very, very excited to have them here today. So help me in the chat give a very big welcome to uh, my friend Ocarina Caro, who again is a maker from, the, uh, from Canada. And I'm going to go ahead and pass her host so she can turn on her video and turn on her audio. So um, Caroline, if you have a, uh, a 
video or audio option at the bottom, please unmute and turn on your camera. And we'll hear from her right now that she's host. I'll let her introduce herself and then we have a video that uh, we'll see from her. I can go? Yes, you can go. <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Karina Caro. Um, my full name is Caroline Soucy. I live in Quebec, Canada. I speak French, but a little bit English. I think it will be okay. So I'm happy today to uh, take part to uh, the festival. I will present you my story and my ocarinas. And it's the first time. Thank you very much for the invitation. And so my ocarina journey began with Zelda Ocarina of Time, of course. So I was 12 years old. I wanted to play absolutely this little instrument. And also I wanted to craft it because uh, I'm, I'm, I like to craft things. So I found a little ocarina in the music shop. This ocarina is my very, very first ocarina I own. It doesn't sound very terrible. But I was pretty amazed by the instrument and I continued it this way. And I developed my own um, pendant because I wanted to, to keep the shape of the ocarina from Zelda. So I have this one. I'm sorry for my, my nails. It's because I redo my hair. It's pink and, and that's good. So my very first ocarinas, um, I made them in 2009. And before that, uh, it, it was um, more whistle. I could not play an entire um, scale. So it was sounding very good for um, the, the start of my journey. And I had the, the first one I made really, they didn't have a clean holes like this. It was not um, something I was thinking about. And then I wanted to make, of course, sweet potato. So I have this one and this one. Both are my very first sweet potatoes. Not ergonomic at all. But not bad. Yeah. Hmm. And then I decided to reduce the number of holes and also switch from the rectangle voicing to the round voicing. So here we have the rectangle voicing and here we have the round voicing. I tried it. At first I had, I have a, I had a lot of problems with that. But then the very last of my nine hole ocarinas, oh no, it's a eight hole. It sounds a lot better. And after I wanted to go with a, a more um, standard version of the, the ocarina. So I made this one. It was uh, uh, an alto C I wanted to develop for students. But the sound was not terrible. After I had two um, uh, two Kickstarter project, uh, which were uh, successful. The first one was to make Zelda Ocarinas. So it's one of them. It's a left-handed Ocarina. And also I made glazed one like this. And 
after, I really wanted to make silver acclaim knives. So I started with um, a sterling silver paste, but it cost so much that I switched to fine silver. And here's one. Also, I wanted to make sculpture. I have this dragon. It's, it's a recent ocarina. It has a, a gemstone on the, on the top of the head. I don't know if the camera is auto-focusing. Also, I have wolves. I like uh, dragons and wolves. This one is very heavy. And I still make, oh, I still make these um, little pendant ocarinas, but with a mold like this one. And of course, I have my Alto C model. I have this one, but this one is in B. At first, when I made my new mold, I had some uh, which turned in uh, C, D, um, D flat and also B. So the sound was increasing with time, you know, with the timeline. And I have this finish, which is a glaze with some colors. I also added gold, it's 24 karat gold. I don't know if I say it like this. And also I have Mother of Pearls, a kind of a shiny finish. I do also horsehair raku. The raku is when you burn the ocarina, uh, you put um, horsehair on it and it instantly burn off and uh, they make a beautiful pattern like this. Uh, in this case, I used uh, an ember shellac And also, sometimes I tried um, several things with the uh, vegetables. I found the uh, um, plants, also some leaves, and also aluminum, <laughs> but it was not successful. <laughs> Here, I have a kind of straw firing from a park uh, where, I, where I live. And also I have the Raku with a clear shellac. Um, it, it's not shellac, it's a, a kind of acrylic uh, clear finish. Uh, it's non-toxic and it's water, water safe. Also, one day I was very inspired and I made an Hydra. It's a three-headed dragon. I was inspired by the movie uh, Percy Jackson, and uh, I, I don't remember the title, but uh, they, it had a, an eye drain too. Uh, but it doesn't play very well. With all uh, this, uh, this clay shrinking from one side to another side, uh, it was not. Uh, Necessarily a good idea, but it's cool. I keep it. So I also tried uh, to use black clay. The black clay is uh, very interesting. It's um, it's dark. I I started to make headed dragon pendants for a, um, a medieval fair. 
But the, um, the black clay contains a lot of silice and um, it has a buildup of condensation into it and we can't play very uh, for long. The sound is very clear, but uh, we can't play for long. Okay, I think I, I did all my, my speech. So I will let you uh, watch a video from um, my YouTube channel uh, to make a carinaz. So uh, here it is. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and share this video. I'm going to mute everybody just so that that way uh, the only sound coming through is the video. Hi, I am Ocarina Caro and I'm going to show you how to make an L2C Ocarina. First, you need to have clay. I have white clay and then I cut it with a metallic wire. I use uh, around a pound or a pound and a half for my L2C Ocarinas. We have to push on the clay to make sure to remove all the air bubbles. Otherwise, our work can explode into the kiln. It happened to me several times and I changed uh, some, uh, uh, several methods uh, into the making. Also, I have a cardboard to clean my table each time I flip the clay. It's because I have uh, a kind of um, paint on my table. It's better to have uh, plain wood. I have two wooden sticks to make sure I have the good thickness. And their diameter is about uh, one centimeter. I have a roller to put on the clay. It's perfect. I remove the lines. Okay, now I cut it with a knife. I try to have uh, two near uh, triangle forms. Here is my plaster mold I made uh, several months ago. We have to put it into the mold with this line on the outside of the mold. With this line. We have to be careful when we do this because it's important to not tear the clay, but not push too hard because we, ha we will change the chamber volume. It's hard to have two times the same chamber volume with this method, but it's an easy method. I am filling the mouthpiece with more clay. I added slip just before because I had some ocarinas which has been uh, exploding into the kiln at the same place. So uh, it's very important to add slip at this step. I am smoothing the inside of the chamber 
and then I will cut it with the wire. I push with my thumbs from the middle to the outside three times so on the ends outside and the last one it's important to clean the wire between each step because it's very messy Now, we have to wait around an hour to make sure the moisture is uh, absorbed by the plaster mold. As you can see, I have a, a spot here to make the sand hole. It's a guide. I use a drill bit to drill the hole. It's not the best way to get a sound hole. It's better to punch the hole instead of pushing all the clay on the side of the hole. Here is my tool to make the wind way. It's flat on this side. This is an easy method, but it's not precise. It's better to include the win-win into the mold. Maybe it will be a change I will do in the future, but for now it's working for me, but um, it's not very precise. I'm smoothing the clay with my finger. I'm pushing the slot stick into the wind weight to give it a shape. And also I push the clay on the side of the wind weight surrounding the slot stick. It's important to take your time at this step because it's very important to have a, a smooth windway. The walls of the windway must be very, very smooth. I'm pushing with my knife on the slot stick to put pressure on it. It's good. I'm removing some extra clay. I use a drill bit, but only the smooth surface of the drill bit, the handle. It's to give the hole a better shape. It's better like this.
You see, I'm going to use a teardrop. So the teardrop shape is the one I chose for the example. I will put a mark into the clay with the handle of this drill bit to make sure it's best aligned with the, the wind wave. You can see it's into the middle. It will be okay for your airstream. So I'm giving it a shape. If the ocarina was liter hard, it could be very easy to uh, cut with a knife, but here uh, it's too smooth to do it. It's not symmetrical. I'm pushing on the clay to make sure it is symmetrical. It's better, but it is not perfect. Really not. In this video, I will reshape several times uh, the sound hole because of the softness of the clay, which is not uh, something I usually do because I wait several hours to make sure it's leader hard. I'm putting some slip to fill the wind way. I'm giving it a shape, cylinder shape, and I add some slip to make sure it's very smooth. It will be the wind way after all. Okay, here it's very important to put pressure on the clay, but you have to begin at the sound hole and then push until you, you reach the end of the mouthpiece and then you smooth all the clay. It's okay if you have clay on the sound hole, we will remove it later. the sound hole. We have to clean it uh, to make sure the inner surface of the chamber is aligned with the slot stick. And we have to remove uh, the slot stick this way to be careful to not break the mouthpiece. Here is uh, two drill bits. I will use the bigger one to push on the clay. It will block the one way, but it's okay. The slot thick would go through. And it's misaligned. We will fix that by pushing the clay near the slot stick. It's not a good option, but it's working. I'm 
cutting the clay. We don't see anything because I work behind the other screen. Good. The autofocus is very annoying. <laughs> Almost done, so I am correcting the angle of the, the sound hole. We have uh, a little bump of clay just here. If it's here, it's also on the other side. We have to check that. It's time to work on the outer side of the ocarina. You see the little crack, it's because we added clay while making the mouthpiece and we have to smooth it with the knife. Sometimes I add slip but the, the clay is very smooth. It's not symmetrical, so I'll, I will push on the clay just here. It's a lot better. I remove a lump of clay. Autofocus. The slot stick is not really exactly aligned with the surface of the inner chamber. It has a slightly little angle. Perfect. Now I cut the outside with a bigger angle. It's very important. And after drying a little bit, I will recut this part. I want to redo the, the, the cutting of this part. I put the two halves together to realign if needed. In this case, yes, I need because the clay is very soft. I'm gonna use my nails to put marks on the fresh clay to do the holes. Also, I need to avoid to have the sound hole and the wind weight in line with the hole. So I will mark the clay with a, a needle tool. Oh! I put a mark 
and both are uh, joining together so I have to change my finger marks I'm smoothing the clay do not be confused uh, between uh, the marks So it's okay with this line. And also it's important to make sure we have the right thumb hole between the first and the middle finger. Drawing the hole. Okay, now I'm ready to drill the holes. I only use a few drill bits to do this. For the first Hole. It's important to give it an angle because if it's uh, perpendicular to uh, the surface, you will be into the clay. You will not be into the chamber. As you can see, we are okay. I always know which one I have to use to make sure I'm near the good hole size but always a little bit smaller than uh, the final size. It will be useful uh, when tuning. It's easier to remove clay than to add clay. focus <laughs> can't stop zooming de zooming zooming de zooming and now I do the same for the thumb holes. And I use the handle of my knife to, to smooth in the inside of uh, the holes and also to uh, enlarge them. Okay, so now I'm doing the undercut, but uh, only a rough version of undercut because I will uh, redo them with a wooden tool. It's not very clean, so here's the wooden tool. I use it like a spoon into a good ice cream. It's very easy to do. Very clean undercuts. Also, I do the same with the other half.
ice cream spoon. I feel hungry. Ta-da! Okay. Now we are ready to join the two halves to the, together. I'm putting some slip on one side. I will do the same for the other side. Joining the halves together. I'm pushing to make sure it's uh, sticking together. I smooth the surface with my fingers and then with the handle of my knife. It's done. So now I cut a piece of the mouthpiece to have a clean line. Here it is. It's beautiful, but I need to redo some part of uh, the voicing. Like I said before, I'm working a second time on this part. I want to give a smoother angle and also I want to smooth the surface. It's important to have a clean knife. Wow, beautiful! I use the handle of my drill bits to smoothen the inside of my holes. I'm doing it fast because uh, I don't have a lot of time for the video. And it's ready for tuning. On the tuner, you can see it's between B and B flat. So my clay has a shrinkage rate of 10 to 12 percent, and from fresh clay to fired clay we gain a tone or just a little under one tone so uh, three quart tone we can say it's important to start from the lowest no note to the highest note while we are tuning to make sure it's coherent. We have to clean more the sound hole a little bit.
Now we are going to remove some clay from the mouthpiece and uh, several places on the ocarina. I like to make big mouthpiece at, at first because uh, uh, we have less cracks while drying to get the little hard uh, stage. So when we cut it at the end, we make sure we have uh, less uh, exploding into the kiln and also less crack. As you can see, I'm drawing a kind of a rectangle and I'll remove uh, the clay around this uh, rectangle following the line of the mouthpiece. I'm cutting the end of the mouthpiece. It was too long. And also, if it's too long and slim, it can break. Here is the result. Now we have to smooth the surface with a wet sponge. I remove the excess of water. I simply rub the sponge all over the ocarina and we have to be careful to not put too much slip uh, inside the holes. At first, I really um, put water on the surface of the ocarina and then I put pressure on the sponge to smooth the surface and remove also uh, uh, the marks I made uh, between the holes. So we have to clean the holes and for this I use uh, the needle tool We have to clean the tool between each hole. I'm smoothing the surface of uh, uh, the edge of the, the thumb holes because it's not very comfortable. In this way, it's more comfortable and we have more stability. sound test. Thanks for watching! Wow, Caroline, thank you so much. That was absolutely awesome. Let me figure out how to stop sharing my screen. That was amazing. Wow. Please, in the chat, I know it wasn't working earlier, but now it's working. Uh, show uh, Caroline your support and thank her for coming to the U.S. Ocarina Festival. 
She was so kind when I invited her to not just show off her products and her ocarinas, and um, she also decided to uh, give us a brief tutorial on how to be able to uh, create an ocarina. So for everybody that's interested in that, that's an awesome, awesome start right there. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Really, really appreciate it. Um, just so you know, guys, before she says her goodbyes, um, I wanted to give you guys a discount code uh, for her store. Um, she is very kind to also uh, give you guys a discount code for uh, any person that's attending the festival. Her discount code is 2020FESTCARO. I'm going to post that in the comments, and I'm also going to post that in the Facebook group. That's a 20% discount code for uh, her ocarinas. So please join me in thanking uh, Caroline. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure and an honor to participate the, to the U.S. Ocarina Festival 2020. Uh, as an ocarina maker and panelist, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I hope you enjoyed um, my ocarina making video uh, with my accent. It was not easy uh, sometimes to understand, but uh, I think uh, it, it was good. So uh, greetings from Quebec, Canada. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. See you soon. Thank you, Caroline. We enjoyed it very much. All right, and up next, we have STL Ocarina. Um, STL Ocarina, uh, do you want me to give uh, Charles or Olivia a host? I'm going to uh, ask Charles real quick. Hey, Charles, you can talk and show your video now. Hello, 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 USOF. This is the big stage, Charles Rummer here once again. And I'd like to bring on my best friend, Miss Olivia Cross. Come on, join the screen. I think Olivia, uh, hang on a moment. Okay. I'll... One second. Sorry about that. Sorry. It's, it's right, cool. You're good. Uh, I, I'm going to make her host as well. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Let's do this. All right. There's Olivia. Hey, Olivia. How are you? Hi. How is everybody? Can you hear me okay? Doing great. All right. Wonderful. Let's do this. <laughs> All right, so I'm Thank going to you, go Charles. ahead and let uh, STL Ocarina take over. Uh, you might know their website, STL Ocarina from St. Louis. And this is my good friend Charles and also Olivia. Uh, they are part of STL. And they're here on behalf of STL to represent them and their ocarinas. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I also just wanted to um, say a big thank you to Nicholas for inviting us. It's awesome that we're able to do this this year. It's very easy. <laughs> I literally just came into work on a Saturday. so. It was very, very easy. Um, and my name is Olivia. I've been working for STL Ocarina for a couple of years now. I do our customer service. I travel for us. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the company today. And then Charles, are you presenting something? Do you want to go before me or do you want to go at the end? You go, ma'am. You go ahead first, ma'am. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to give kind of an overall background of our company, our history, um, different ways in which we reach our audiences. Um, I'm also going to give a sneak peek of a series of ocarinas that I've actually been working on for the last couple of months that I don't think we've told anybody about yet. So I will be showing you some, some uh, drawn prototypes and those will hopefully come out either kind of just depending on, on how the world is, um, maybe next year or the year after that. So we'll kind of have to see, but I'm really excited to share that with everybody. So we'll talk about our design process a little bit, some of the things that we keep in mind. Um, and then also some educational outreach, just a little bit, some things that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, and then we can take, I can, if anybody wants to put questions in while I'm talking, that's fine. And I'm happy to answer it as I go. Um, or if you want to save them for the end, that's totally fine too. But I, I do like getting questions at a time when I'm talking about the topic. So that'd be great. If you have a specific question, just feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so STL Ocarina actually started as a music school um, quite a few years ago primarily with string instruments. And the idea was just to make music more accessible in general um, to, to kids in the area. We're from St. Louis, Missouri, so the Midwest area. And then we found the ocarina um, pretty much by accident. We just kind of stumbled across it. And at first we thought, well, this might be a way to enhance and also supplement the school, maybe potentially found our own location, have our own school. 
And then it quickly became clear that there was a huge demand for the ocarina, um, more so than we, we had known about at the time. Um, we discovered Legend of Zelda, the whole culture that is associated with that. And it really kind of opened up um, a whole new world, musically speaking. We realized that this instrument could do so much more than we originally knew it could. Um, so we decided to start pursuing, making, designing, distributing ocarinas. And you're probably most familiar um, with this one here. I'll be holding a couple things up to the camera today, but this is our Ocarina of Time. I see Charles also has his over there. <laughs> and that is an alternate version as well. Yeah, that is the other version. This one is ceramic. So I'll do a brief little sound sample here. And then we also have a plastic version of that as well. And those are probably two of our most well-known models. Um, obviously, Legend of Zelda is awesome. Uh, but the plastic mold is really, really wonderful. And I'll be mentioning that a little bit later in our educational section as well. Yep. Um, so those two have definitely been our best sellers. Those are something that, that bring people back over and over. But because of that, and because those are so popular, it's allowed us to really expand in terms of design and kind of pushing, kind of getting out of our comfort zone a little bit, so to speak, in terms of design and trying to reach a wider audience and uh, meet people kind of at their particular stage of their musical journey, not just with Legend of Zelda, but with many other things. Um, and everybody that, that works here is a musician. So originally um, everybody was a musical teacher. Um, I have a degree in music theory. I'm a singer. Um, it was a very weird switch going from singing opera to playing the ocarina. I don't know if I can recommend that very awkward transitional period that I had. Um, I sounded pretty horrific on ocarina for a little while, but um, yeah, so everybody that is here does have a musical background, and our number one goal here is to make music accessible to anyone. Um, that is our passion. I've been able to work with Nicholas several times. Um, he actually uses many, many of our ocarinas, so many of them. I think you have like half of our stock ever, <laughs> um, both plastic, ceramic, double chamber, everything like that. And he has been able to enhance his classroom, jumpstart his students' musical journey, which has been really wonderful. Um, so, and then we officially became STO Ocarina in 2005, so 15 years this year, which is pretty awesome. Um, we've expanded our range of products quite a bit this year. I'll be showcasing a few newer ocarinas that we have. Um, and then also in terms of supplementary materials, we've released a lot of textbooks, um, sheet music. We have a digital music library where you can go purchase ocarina tabs, sheet music, things like that, and actually get them emailed to you. So because our audience um, is not just in America, we have worldwide customers audience. We do want to make the music accessible no matter where you are, especially because shipping is a little bit crazy right now. So we do try and offer things that people can just immediately download as well from the website. And we even do commissions at this point as well. Um, I'm one of those really, really geeky people that actually likes notating music from YouTube videos and making it into Ocarina tabs. So you can actually request a specific song if you're looking for something and I will be able to make it for you and email it to you. So that's a lot of fun for me to do as well. And that's also something that the Ocarina has done, I think for us is it's, it's brought us so much closer to a lot of our audience. You know, people send you requests for things or um, we also travel to comic cons and conventions typically throughout the year. Um, unfortunately, not this year, of course, but hopefully next year we'll be back on the convention circuit. Uh, but it, it brings people together. It's, it's created a community for us. We've realized that so many people love this instrument for so many different reasons. Um, that's been really fun to experience as well. Our, our main goal um, over time, besides making music more accessible, educational outreach, is to try and fill whatever gap we can see in the ocarina market. So obviously there are a lot of these out there. There are a lot of different kinds of these out there. So being able to, to produce a really good mold, a good sound, something solid, that was important. That was kind of the first step. And then after that, we thought, okay, what are some different keys that we can provide, different textures, um, different sound timbres, sound uh, qualities, if you will. What are some things that we can offer that we're not seeing um, elsewhere? Or just things that we think we want to experiment with. Um, I think that's part of the fun, as well as making the ocarina, designing it, distributing it, is you get to try a lot of new things. You get to try, what are the limits of ceramic, basically? That's what we're trying to do. And especially with the, the collection that I've been working on for the last couple of months, you know, the goal with that was, okay, it's gonna start out as a sketch on paper. Maybe we put it on a computer. Let's see how far we can go before it then becomes like physically impossible to make this ocarina. And that's part of the fun of it too. Um, so some ways in which we reach our audience um, on our website is stlocarina.com. Um, we do a lot of multimedia content. We do have some CDs available for purchase on our website. 
We also have digital music you can just download on iTunes. Um, I haven't bought a CD in quite a long time. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but <laughs> um, And then, of course, digital tabs. You can download Ocarina tabs online. Let me give an example of what those look like, just in case. I'm yep. sure most people are quite familiar, but this is one of our yep. Legend of Zelda books here. So you one can of the very tabs. first song books I ever got. That's right. It's been around for a long time. You can get those emailed to you directly, which is quite fun. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a YouTube channel. We actually just started a TikTok, which is really fun. I have found myself on TikTok. <laughs> I thought I would end up there. Um, but, you know, finding ways to show people new songs that you can play, new styles that you can play in, kind of mixing up genres, things like that, lets you really reach a much wider audience than ever before. You know, again, not just within the Legend of Zelda community, but within the musical community yep. as a whole. Um, so that's been really fun and, and TikTok is new and I, I hope we can do more with that. I think that'll be really fun. A little bit yep. scary, but I think it'll be fun. Um, and then with all of our ocarinas, of course, you get a wide range of instructional materials. Um, every purchase, you'll get free lessons within your yep. order confirmation email, which are really helpful just to kind of start out with. We have a page on our website with fingering charts for all different kinds of ocarinas. Um, we also have, like I said, the, the method books. Um, we just actually came out with a couple new books that I will show a little bit later on. But those have been really fun to write as well. I've been writing a, a textbook for the last couple months as well, and that's been quite fun. Um, and then just a wide range of, of different types of sheet music as well. And for some people, you know, I know a lot of people prefer ocarina tablature, and then some people prefer traditional notation. So we try to offer quite a bit of both just to kind of meet whatever you're looking for, because I know people do have different preferences. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the design process here. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys a sneak peek. Um, so this is based off of, I'm sure a lot of people in here have played Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, yeah, <laughs> Charles, yeah. Uh, but this is based off the alignments from Dungeons and Dragons. So this is actually a nine part series wow. that we're going to be releasing. Um, so I'm going to, I'm so sorry for any video quality or picture air quality here that we have, but um, so this is our lawful yeah. column here, neutral, and then chaotic. Wow. And then we've got the the evil row, <laughs> the, the neutral row, yep. and the good row. And I'll zoom in just a little bit here. Oh, make sure I'm getting this right. Lawful good, lawful neutral, lawful evil. For example, you can see there's some words written next to some of these different tunings, different sizes here. Wow. Um, we'll also be playing with some different textures with some of these as well. So that's how, that's basically how our design process will start is sometimes it's even just taking out a piece of paper and a pen yep. and coming up with some kind of shape that we haven't done before. Um, or I walk around our, our stock rooms and I look and we think, what, what do we not have yet? What's something that we haven't done yet? Um, definitely with some of these, I want to experiment with different keys. We'd love to do a B flat someday. Love to do E major, E flat, et cetera. Um, people ask for lots of different keys. Um, pretty much every time we go to a Comic-Con, I get requests for B flat, you know, B, you can try something different. So that is, that's something that we definitely want to try with this one. But the goal there is to provide um, a wide variety. So you see there are, there are both 12 holes as well as six holes in this collection. So this is a six hole, six hole here, six hole up here, as well as some 12 holes. So these will work for a first time player, intermediate or advanced player. It is accessible to all different difficulty levels. Yep. Um, and then some of those six holes will be bass six holes. I personally really like the sound of a bass six hole pendant. Some of those will be sopranos, which are a little easy to travel with. Um, and then with the 12 holes, we have a variety of soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, et cetera. Um, so trying to find something for everybody. Yep. Um, and that's basically how they will start is, you know, with the D&D &D alignments, it's great because you do have those concepts already laid out for you. So you do have kind of a framework to go off of. But sometimes it's something a bit more abstract. Um, for example, let's pull up another one here. Mm -hmm. Some people might be familiar with our Nebula series. This is a much more abstract idea. This isn't really Nebula. based on anything you know that might immediately jump out at you. This one does have turquoise here. Uh, but the name Nebula evokes you know space-like themes, something a little more abstract, a little bit more cosmic. So it kind of lets you fill in the blanks, as it were, a little bit with the story as well. Whereas with D&D &D alignments, I mean, you've got that all laid out for you. Yeah, Charles has a different color scheme on yeah. his as well. This is smoky. Yeah, this is a smoky gray model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They all have different gemstones yep. on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those also have a more matte-like texture as well. They feel um, a little bit more similar to like a bone. If you think about bone yep. quality, that's what they will feel like as opposed to, let's say, the more traditional glaze, the shiny glaze that we're all familiar with here. 
And it's also um, a very fun instrument to play as well. I like this one. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that one, the high notes on that one are very smooth, very smoky, not very piercing or sharp. So again, also with these new models, we're experimenting with how can we get those high notes just right? How can we get the range even more consistent um, as you go up in terms of breath pressure, things like right. that. Um, another big concept would just be, would be texture in general as well. Um, another example, actually I have two different examples here, would be the Ember Ocarina. This came out a little while ago. And you can see it's very rough, very textured, um, it's supposed to feel a little bit like Dragon Scale. So for you yep. Game of Thrones fans out there, this one's pretty fun. And plus this it is has a good grip for your fingers. Plus it has a good grip for your fingers too. Like mm -hmm. here. Because it isn't a shiny. Yeah, here's a little yep. sound sample. I always play a Game of Thrones on it for people at the cons. <laughs> and then another example would be something like this. This is our Elf Ocarina. You can see the almost opalescent kind of pearly finish to that. So you have a lot to play with, even if you're just taking a basic 12-hole mold. You have so much room to work with in terms of the finish on it. Do you want it matte? Do you want it shiny? Do you want it bumpy? You know, what kind of texture do you want to play with there? So that can totally change everyone's playing experience, right? Some people prefer a much more matte um, grip, and then others do prefer that shiny texture. Um, so with that one, with this collection, I haven't fully decided yet, but this one is definitely going to have a much more shiny, um, almost like a, I'm trying to evoke kind of a nautical feel here, almost a little bit Cthulhu-like, if anybody's familiar with that. So this one will look a little more alien in terms of the texture. It's going to fade out perhaps from matte to shiny. Still kind of throwing around ideas, but that's one of the things that you do take into account when you are designing is how can I make this something that is truly unique, something that will tell a story, something that will kind of inspire people perhaps. Um, and not just be a musical instrument, but also a piece of art for them as well, something that will tell a story. Um, so you've got the nebula, matte, ember, ocarina, a little more scaly, um, and then color as well. I think every maker is always trying to find a new color, a new color combo, something that we haven't done before. Um, for example, with this one, you want to evoke kind of the style of the butterfly wing, so getting that color fade will be very vivid, very bright, something very colorful. Um, whereas some people prefer a much more minimal style. I think even with the nebula, it's much more muted, much more neutral. Um, Charles also yep. had the other color, which shows that as well. Or yes, even something like this, which I'll also mention later on. This is our left-handed model here. And Whoa. this is a, a cool gray. Yeah. So sometimes Lefty. it's great. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's great to just have the minimal kind of classic look. But then sometimes you want to go a little bit crazy. So I yep. think with this collection, <laughs> I wanted to go a little bit crazy and have some fun. Um, especially because there's there's so much to the D&D alignments. There's a lot of meaning behind that. So there's a lot to build off of um, for that. Um, and with the colors, I tried to kind of give an idea of the morality of each character. So you can see that the evil row here is much darker <laughs> than the good row here up at the top. So you can use color to kind of, and then you can see a little more balance throughout neutral, right? And then true neutral is going to be a little more marbled almost, just kind of a misty, foggy kind of texture. So you can use the color to really kind of personify the instrument um, as it was. And then you've got tuning size, things like that. Of course, tuning and size will work together. Um, I definitely don't just want to make, you know, tenor after tenor after tenor. You do want to have lots of basses, sopranos, altos. And on that note, um, every now and then we do get asked how we classify the voicings of our ocarinas. And it is based on the SATB style of voicing, um, which is more of a vocal concept. So you've got bass, um, sometimes baritone, tenor, alto, and soprano going from lowest to highest. And that's how our ocarinas are named. So what some people call alto C, we also call tenor. So those are the same thing, just to give context. So this would be an alto C, and then for us, it'll be a tenor. Uh, but with tunings, you know, like I said, I want to try and do B flat sometime. Definitely want to try and experiment with different keys um, because sometimes you just need a D major ocarina, which we did just make one. Um, last year we have the Mirage, which is in D major. Sometimes you want something a little bit lighter, a little bit higher than C major. Yep. Sometimes you need a soprano for certain songs, you know, for really fast jigs or something like that. You do want, let's say, a soprano in C. So there'll be a different need for different tunings. And I like to experiment with it. I like to see, you know, what kind of sound quality comes out if we try for A flat, you know, because you never know what you're going to get. Um, and I do see one question on the side here. Uh, do your customers buy more ocarinas with unique shapes or with the classic sweet potato design? I would say, I would say it's about 50-50 because, I mean, a lot of our audience is definitely oriented towards Legend of Zelda, so they will go for this classic yeah. design here. 
Um, however, we also have other Zelda ocarinas. We have a pendant um, in the shape of a rupee. We have pendants in the shape of Legend of Zelda shields. So we do have other alternative styles that people will also buy because they are still Legend of Zelda themed. So they give you a little bit more freedom in terms of style and how you play. And then I would say that lately over the last couple of years, as we have branched out with different styles and designs, those have been extremely popular. Something like the Nebula, this more matte feeling, mm -hmm. has been really popular because I, and I personally like the matte feel. I do like that bone like kind mm -hmm. of texture. And we found that many other people do as well. Yeah. So anytime we come out with something new like that, there is a great, there's, a, there's really good feedback for it. So that just encourages me, I think, to experiment more you know, I really look forward to when this next collection comes out. I think that it will provide um, something new, something that people yep. haven't seen before. And I think that, that, that people are coming to Ocarina's, you know, number one, perhaps for sound quality, but also for an artistic experience yep. as well. So if you can experiment with that a lot, that tends to be very, very popular. Um, and especially at on the floor at a, at a convention, let's say, if you have something that looks really cool, it will literally stop people in their tracks and they'll walk over because it looks so cool because it is a piece of art. And that's sometimes what draws people over in the first place, actually. Um, next, another question here. Let's see. What is the biggest challenge for an ocarina maker? Um, I don't personally make them myself, but I can speak from the sense of our company. Um, I think it's finding new things that people are really interested in, um, not just Legend of Zelda, but kind of defining yourself and saying, what is your artistic identity? Um, where do you stand within the ocarina community? Because there are a lot of different ocarinas of time, as it were, out there. I think we've probably all seen many, many, many of them mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. whether they're good, whether they're bad. There's a lot of them out there. Um, yeah. So it's, it's what else can you do? What else can you offer? Um, how can you enrich the experience of playing the ocarina for your audience? Um, and that ties in with, with the, the supplemental materials that we've made, the textbooks, offering online lessons, things like that. I think so much to the experience of playing the ocarina. Um, so coming from our company's perspective, I would say it's, it's how do you make the experience of playing the ocarina more meaningful? How do you make it better? How do you make it something that lasts a lifetime and not just as a, a novelty experience, perhaps? Um, so that is one perspective. Um, everybody will tell you something different probably though. Um, and then, so let's see, let's conclude with the design process here. Um, in terms of size, you know, I do like to make, like have really big ones or really small yeah. ones. Everybody's hand size is different. So you do also have to take that into account. Some people are more comfortable with a base. You know, have people come up and they have huge hands. I have pretty small hands, so I tend to go for a tenor or an alto. But you also want to offer a soprano for people who have really yep. small hands. So it's good to have. Even for young musicians, to for young musicians too. Exactly. Like for example, we um offer our style ocarina for schools and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And also we um offer um ocarina packages like for for people who want to buy the songbooks and what comes with the instruments as well. Mm -hmm. And the little six-hole pendant styles, those are perfect for kids, especially the plastic ones. They can throw them around. They'll be totally right. fine. I don't think I've ever been able to break one. So if anybody can, let me know. I'll give you another one. <laughs> I haven't broken any of mine either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so to conclude, and I'll give you one more, one more look here at the whole collection here. Um, yeah, I'm very, very excited about this. But um, yeah, so all of the things that we're thinking about in terms of the design process, we're coming at them, you know, not just from the perspective of um, a musician, but also because I think the ocarina can reach um, oh, I see Nicholas said that someone broke uh -oh. one. Oh, no. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay, Nicholas, you got to tell me about that later, okay? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, but when we are designing, we're, we're not just coming at it as a musician, but also from the perspective of our audience. Our audience is made up of writers, of composers, of artists, of creative thinkers. Mm -hmm. So as we create different designs, we don't just want to think about it in terms of, of us. I mean, we are all professional musicians, but I, I also want to come at it from the perspective of, you know, what kind of story can I tell people? What yep. kind of thoughts can I inspire in them um, when they see our ocarinas? We do want it to be something meaningful. I want someone to see an ocarina and have an experience from it. Um, so that is something I've put a lot of thought into these, yeah. these designs, spent a lot of time thinking, how can we tweak it? What kind of color accent yeah. can we add? Um, it's a long, it's a long process. Yep. Um, and then, let's see. And then another thing that we that we do as a company, we've been doing this for for quite a long time. Um, is we do go to comic cons and conventions throughout the year, primarily throughout the summertime. Um, so a little bit more popular time for people to mm -hmm. go. But basically, from you know around March through October, sometimes November, we will be traveling. So we yep. want people to be able to try these in person. 
uh, because our store is is online only we don't have a physical storefront so we try to rather go out and meet our fans meet our customers our audience and let them try new models um, otherwise it's you know it can be hard to to buy an right. instrument online and not know what it feels like or what it sounds like um, so and that is another benefit of having a YouTube channel obviously you can you can upload sound samples um, hey, Olivia, but we go I don't want to interrupt but uh, somebody has their hand up um, and I just wanted to see if it was okay with y'all to answer some questions like that if you okay. see on your uh, like um, I guess right hand corner you can look where it says attendees and Mark Chan has a question and uh, yep. you're welcome to just let him talk if uh, you want. He, uh, I think he wants to ask his question out loud. Okay. Okay, let's see, how do I? I can try to help if you'd like. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with how to, how do All I right. get him? You should have oh, he said he, oh, he said he accidentally hit it. Oh, okay, no problem. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, Sorry uh oh. About that. All good, okay, wonderful. Well, if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, oh, I see another one here. Have you guys thought about going to exhibit halls for music education conferences? Um, yes, we actually do go to a couple. Um, since we are located in St. Louis, Missouri, we go to MMEA, which is in uh, Lake of the Ozarks, that area. We go there mm -hmm. every January. Um, I actually went to University of Missouri, St. Louis, so I see a lot of classmates and teachers there, which is always really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we go to that one. We've gone to quite a few. We always go to TMEA um, in Texas. Which is right here in, which is right here in Texas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's always wonderful. We did a, we actually did a presentation um, two years ago, I believe. Yeah. And then um, just back in March, we went to the Oak Convention um, at Nicholas's invitation again, which was wonderful. Thank you wow. again, Nicholas. And I was lucky enough to sit in on Nicholas's presentation. Um, about the Oak Arena, and that was um, specifically a Kodai method um, oriented conference. So Nicholas's presentation was about how to fit the Oak Arena um, into the Kodai method, and that mm -hmm. kind of ties into my next section here, which was about our educational outreach. Um, one aspect of the Oak Arena that, that I was really impressed with, because I'm not um, proficient in the Kodai method myself, I didn't go to school for music education, so I wasn't quite as familiar with it, but listening to Nicholas's presentation, um, he made it so clear that the Oak Arena fits in perfectly with different educational methods, whether you're coming at it from a more traditional perspective or even the Kodai method, which is typically for vocalists for singing. Um, but because of the range of the Oak Arena, whether it be six hole or 12 hole, it does really fit into that extremely well. Um, and he's used that in his classrooms many, many times over the years um, and has had wonderful results. So that was very wonderful. And I was able to, we had a booth there and so we were there all weekend. And that, that's a really awesome experience for us. Every time we're able to go to an educational event and I have kids walking up to the booth, teachers walking up to the booth, families, et cetera, you know, I'm able to teach most people a song in let's say three or four minutes, maybe sometimes less. Sometimes it's like 30 seconds. You just hold it up and play Zelda's Lullaby and they're able to imitate you perfectly. Um, some people are very lucky like that. Um, for me, it took a little bit longer, but uh, that is a really wonderful experience when you can see someone just walk up and pick up an instrument and they just suddenly realize, oh, I, I can play this. This is no big deal. You know, this is something that is accessible, um, very gentle learning curve. You can get a great sound quality right away. As so many of you, I'm sure, have experienced, it's something that it's, it's not, not to bash, you know, like violin or piano or anything like that, because I actually grew up playing violin and piano myself. I played for many years. I think back to when I was five or six, you know, if I had picked up an ocarina, at the time I had no idea what they were, but if I had picked one up, I think it would have been, I think I would have learned how to play in such a short amount of time. I think it would have been wonderful and definitely added something uh, to my experience. So being able to meet people at events like that, conventions like that, yep. is always very, it's very heartwarming. It gives you a lot of encouragement and a lot of motivation for continuing to push the ocarina in schools um, as an alternative to recorder. Um, we also have many teachers come up and just say, I'm, I'm looking for something new. You know, I'm looking for something fresh, something to kind of mix up the classroom. Um, this plastic model here uh, does have a Triforce on it, but we have a lot of different colors without the Triforce. That's typically what we use in the classroom. Um, we also have a smaller, just round, basic six-hole plastic pendant style. I hope that's not the one that got dropped eight stories and was broken, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but those are also great for students with smaller hands um, or students who have any kind of physical challenges on these fingers, because all you need is the first three fingers of each hand to play. So those plastic ones have had great, great results because they do also give you a really good tone quality. Yep. And I think for younger players, being able to get that right away is, is very encouraging. And it also makes the teacher's experience a lot better, right? <laughs> yes. And I've got a, 
and I got a quote for that as well. It's from one of my favorite um, artists, Bob Ross. Can I share that yeah. with y'all? Yeah. Talent is a pursued interest. Anything that you're willing to practice, you can do. Wonderful. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, let's see. And we also, we've worked with many different teachers. So we've worked with Nicholas for a long time. Nicholas is really wonderful. Um, I always have so much fun. Anytime I'm, you know, working with him, going to conventions with them. I think I've gone to, to two with you now. Uh, but that was really wonderful. Um, and we're able to kind of customize different curriculums for different teachers, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, because every classroom is different. Every student is different. Certain ocarinas might not work for everyone. You know, someone, people have different needs. So that's been a great learning process, um, a great experience. Um, I taught privately throughout college. It's been really wonderful to work with teachers again. Um, and, and these students kind of get their, their musical journey started with the ocarina. So that's something that we do want to pursue, um, continue pursuing in the future. And it's something that we believe in very passionately. Um, like I said, all of us are professional musicians and we've seen our own lives be benefited and, and enriched so much by music. So that is something that we want to continue passing on to future generations. And I think that the ocarina is a great way to do that because you can start so young, you can start playing at any age um, because we do have the plastic models quite low risk, a very low risk instrument to start on. Um, right. And then let's see, let's show a couple. I saw that Charles already had one that I'm going to talk about. You had yep. the Phoenix out earlier. Yes, ma'am. Well. had the Phoenix Ocarina right here. Wonderful. It's a so 12 hole in C major. Amazing Ocarina to play. And I really love playing this one. Um, I, and I'm going to see if I can pull up the website while I'm at it too. You don't yeah, mind? And do you, do yeah. And do you want to give us a short sound sample of the yes, Phoenix? Yes, yes ma'am. Wonderful. Go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna give a little description about this bad boy first. Okay. <laughs> okay, experience power regeneration as you wield this ocarina, featuring a stunning array of hand-painted details. Our newest and perhaps most intricate design yet challenged the mythical aesthetic suitable for any skill level. Tune in C major, this ocarina is stuff made of legends. Beautiful. Thank you, Charles. So that is one of the more recent ocarinas that we have come out with. Um, the goal with that was to create kind of a carved texture and design um, over a simple black base. So this ocarina is a little bit more matte. It isn't as shiny or slippery. It does have a more easily grippable texture. Um, and then the overlay has gold paint over top. So the goal with this was to, was to go a little bit more out of our comfort zone to create something that was a little bit more complex looking. We've definitely never made anything quite like that before. Um, it also has a partner in the collection, the Dragon Ocarina, which is the kind of silver counterpart Charles has gathered there as well. <laughs> yes, wonderful. And those both came out um, this past year. Um, those are both tenor C majors. So that was one kind of design step for us was that, that collection there. Um, creating a, a new texture that we haven't really tackled before, the, the carved look and feel. And I, I like them. I very much like them for the grip. It's very easy to hold and to play. Uh, they have a beautiful tone quality, and I think they just look so fun. I think they really do tell a story. Um, so those are some of the ones that we've come out with recently. I wanted to highlight two others as well. Um, these are a little bit, a little bit more different. Um, so we encountered a student um, locally, actually, who was missing some fingers from her left hand and so therefore was not able to play the traditional 12 hole style. Um, so we wanted to create something that would allow for one handed playing if needed. So we have the ambidextrous ocarina here. Um, this gives a range of B4 to C6 on either side. So you have a scale on either side. You can play one handed like this. Also comes with a neck strap. Um, and then in her case, she could hold like this and then play over here. So that was a design that we came up with. If you do, let's say only have the use of one hand, limited use of the other hand, if you have any physical challenges like this, this model might make it possible to play. Um, and this is just a simple matte black design here. So that is our ambidextrous ocarina. It's another recent model that we just came out with. And I mentioned this one a little bit earlier. It's been asked many times for a left-handed style. So we did, we did finally come up with that. And this one's quite nice. I will tell you, it feels so odd to play a left-handed ocarina though. My goodness, 
I feel like my brain is exploding. <laughs> but that one feels quite different. Um, so we came out with that one as well. And that's just your standard C major tenor design and sound, yep. but everything is flipped for those who wanted a left hand ocarina. And then another one I wanted to highlight was the panpipe quadruple chamber ocarina here. I'm trying to get the next strap out of the way here for you. Wow. And this one is um, designed to kind of evoke the traditional panpipe aesthetic, but this is entirely ceramic and gives you a range of C5 to A7, so almost three octaves. And there wow. are separate chambers there. And that is another one that we just came out with. So in terms of structure, in terms of the actual design of your Karina, we did experiment a little bit recently with that. Um, I think with the next collection, definitely want to experiment with color combination, um, more things a little bit more on the surface level. But it is important to, to experiment with this, this yep. structure and come up with something that you just, I just don't see something like this very much at all. Um, so we like creating new things like that. A lot of these were requests from people that we had heard either at conventions or online. Yep. Uh, people were asking, can you make this? Can you do that? And yep. eventually you, you think, all right, let's give it a go. Let's try that because enough people really, really want it. Yep. Um, definitely the left-handed ocarina was one of those. Yep. Um, and then I wanted to mention two of our books that we just released. Um, the first one is specifically for multi-chamber ocarinas and it is called The Art of Chamber Switching for Double Ocarina. This just came out recently and is now available online. And this is just a great resource if you are, let's say, picking up double ocarina or mm -hmm. triple ocarina for the first time, um, or even if you've been playing for a little while, but you kind of just want more review, a little bit more tips on the method of chamber switching. That one is very handy. Yep. That one just came out. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the book that I just released. This came out over the weekend of 4th of July. And this is a textbook based on um, learning classical music. Wow. Ocarina. So we have, you know, we have our method books and that is kind of starting from square one. That's teaching you how to read music, yep. a little bit of basic musical theory. We have those for the double ocarina, the six hole ocarina as mm -hmm. well. Um, but my background is primarily um, actually Baroque and Renaissance music. Um, that is the type of music that I perform and sing. And a lot of it works really, really well on the ocarina. Sometimes you have to um, switch a couple things down in octaves. Sometimes you have to transpose a little bit. But it really sounds beautiful on the ocarina. Um, composers like Bach, Beethoven, Handel, Mozart, all of the great, you know, traditional guys. A lot of that music sounds really, really good on the ocarina. And I didn't often see, um, see that performed a lot. Um, it is every now and then, but I just wanted to make something that would be a resource um, for people who, let's say, didn't encounter the ocarina through Legend of Zelda or they didn't encounter it through more popular resources, but they're coming from a more traditional background. Um, let's see. Oh, I see a question I, over here about yep. the books too. Um, the two music books are those tabs or sheet music. So the classical book, I'll, I'll open it up and I'll show you a little bit inside. This is an example of a page here. So you will get an introduction, some things to look out for, and then you will have traditional notation within the book itself. And then this book comes with online supplementary materials and that includes um, the tablatures for every single song in this book. So if you do want to review any finger placement um, after you've looked at the sheet music, you can go online and access all of that for free. So you will have the complete tabs for that online. And then the chamber switching book, I'll open that up as well. This one is traditional sheet music. You can see inside. One is traditional sheet music. Um, and then with the, with the classical music book, so you have, um, there's six chapters in here. Each one has a different emphasis. And so the repertoire was selected for the goal of um, sort of accenting whatever emphasis I was choosing. So for some of them, let's give an example here. Chapter one is just about breathing, developing your breath support, some simple exercises. Um, different chapters will focus on different things, um, such as arpeggios, more complicated fingering yep. styles, things like that. Um, so each one is designed to kind of help you practice and enforce different aspects of playing the ocarina. And it's just doing that through classical repertoire. Yes. And here's, uh, which I think can, and here's yeah, another ahead, method book right here. This is called The Joy of Music, Ocarina Method for the Homeschool Classroom by Julia Cruz. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, I don't, I don't know if you know this, Charles, but I was actually homeschooled all the way up until college. So nope. that is another thing. Wow. Yeah, I think Ocarina is, is great for homeschooling. Um, I could say personal experience, I had a lot of time to practice music growing up because I was homeschooled. Yep. I practiced Beethoven for yep. way, way too long every day. But yep. <laughs> yeah, and also another good one is um, Tchaikovsky. I love Tchaikovsky myself. Mm -hmm. A little, sometimes difficult to fit in the range of the Ocarina, but yes. True. <laughs> yep. yes. And then we also will have a new album um, coming out about the middle of, it is, it's August today, isn't it? Yeah. 
uh, middle of this month, and that is um, a selection of songs from Hamilton. <gasps> that will be quite fun. <laughs> yeah, I see Gerald's face just lit up. <laughs> yeah, I love Broadway musicals. Wonderful. Yeah, and that will be available online. That'll be an entirely digital release. Yep. Um, and then, so at this point, um, Charles, did you have anything you wanted to present? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to present this, um, this amazing, um, have you talked about multi-chambers yet? I have not. Go for it. Okay. Well, this is one of our multi-chamber ocarinas right here. This is the um, Purple Clay um, STL Double Ocarina. It is a really amazing ocarina to play, and um, it's, quite, it's actually one of my favorites. And It's even got more holes, which means more notes, and quite frankly, it's one of the best ones that I've ever played in my whole life. And um, also, it um, gives you more range as well. So, um, thank, so if I'm, um, like, here's a little sound sample. I'll play the whole scale for you. That's first chamber. Oh, shoot. Plus, you can also do, like, um, plus you can add more songs to it um, to your repertoire than just with a regular 12-fold transfer arena right there. Wonderful. How many ocarinas do you have at this point, Charles? You must have quite a collection. Yep. You keeping track? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Wonderful. And also, um, also, um, I also have um, a thing called the STL Ocarina Podcast every Thursday on Facebook as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Did you want to present anything else, Charles? Did you have a video you wanted to play or anything like that? I think I'm actually going to practice our Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 2.0. This is our 2.0 Legends Auto Ocarina of Time model. And um, the, the Nebula, which we've talked about, detected on numerous times today. And the Dragon, and also our Ember from our Legend series, right here. And this is from our Element series, one of the, um, one of the most popular series right now on, on the STL Ocarina website. And um, there's one with um, the fire, which, um, which, we haven't, which we didn't get a chance to show in this video, but you can look at all on, um, on stlocarina.com. So check it out. Wonderful. Um, so I wanted to, Nicholas, I just wanted to say thank you again for inviting us today. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. It's very easy, very easy to come here, Absolutely. which is so wonderful. Very um, nice, Olivia. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask either in the chat or uh, with the, the hands up feature, I'm not very tech savvy, so sorry. I do have a great. question that somebody asked before I ask Sir, uh, Durian to hop on here. Uh, somebody asked in the question and answer, is it possible to play a high G on the 12 full plastic ocarinas? Uh, I saw Milt had this uh, technique, but I can't do it. Currently, I'm, I'm thinking about buying a double chamber ocarina, but I really don't know if that ocarina should be ceramic or plastic. So um, do you guys know if it can be played? So the range of that particular ocarina would go up to high F. If they do want to play high G, I would probably recommend a double ocarina. Okay. Uh, because if you're wanting to play a high G, you'll probably end up wanting to play a high A, B, and C, et cetera, at some point. So I think it would just be worth it to go ahead and get a double chamber. Can I say something about that? Yes. So I have my SCL plastic right here, and I'm not super great at reaching the high G, but I did it w when this person asked a question just to test it out, and I'll try to do it. Almost. I did it a moment ago. If I do it again, <laughs> I'll let y'all know. There it is. Neat. But I've done it before, and um, David has taught my students how to do it too. So All right. it can be done on the plastic 12 fold, if that answers your question. I hope it does. All right. Uh, well, say a very big thank you on the chat for SEO Ocarina. Um, thank you very much um, to see, uh, for them being here, for Olivia and Charles, and thank you for them sharing their ocarinas with us today. They do have a discounted call uh, code called Charles, and it's 25% off uh, their entire ocarina selection. So I'll be posting that in the chat at the end, and also be posting uh, Ocarina Caro's discount link in the chat and on the Facebook. So uh, let's give also a uh, big thanks to SEL and a big welcome to
to our last uh, maker today, which is Songbird Ocarina. We're very excited to have them here today with us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let um, Durian take over. And I'm going to uh, help him turn his video on. And let me know if you can turn on your video, Durian. Um, if uh, you guys have any questions for Durian, uh, please feel free to leave those in the chat. Uh, we're very excited to see what he has to show us today. So uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Songbird Ocarina today. Can you hear me, Dorian? I think uh, it might have crashed uh, for uh, Dorian's uh, Zoom. Let's see. It might be because of uh, being on mobile. It uh, might uh, hang on just a moment, one moment, and we'll get this figured out. No problem. And sorry about that. In the meantime, I might try to get that high G again while we're waiting for Durian to log. Oh, there he is. All right, let's see if this works again. If it's crashing. Oh, hey. Turn on the audio on that one. Okay, hi. Audio down. Okay, let's start the video. You cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Okay, I tell him to. to enable it. Uh, but I have to change you to host. Um, let me see. If I change you to host, it might knock you off though, like it did a moment ago. Okay, I'll bounce back. Okay, let's see. Did that work? Yes. Oh, excellent. Hi. Yeah, okay, hello, Dorian. It's such a pleasure to see you. Hi. Thank you, Nicholas. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. So, welcome to Songbird Oak Arena. Thanks for inviting us to the Ocarina Festival. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here with all of you. And it's been so uh, inspiring and educational to hear all the presentations so far. So this is Songbird Ocarina. We are in sunny Los Angeles. And uh, we always have our mask close by. As you've probably noticed, it's hard to play Ocarina and wear a mask at the same time. So we're, there's a lot of this going on, but we will survive and we will make do. So thank you again for having us here. and. Let's see if we can add to our experience of our ocarina enthusiasm and our excitement for everything ocarina related. So welcome again. And I would like to add to the conversation by sharing some of what we're passionate about here and some of what is inspiring us to um, grow in, in our ocarina playing and making. And so I'm happy to share with you some of my latest inspirations and musical adventures. So what do we have here? Uh, to thank Eric, my office elf, who is holding the camera. And at some point, we're going to flip the camera around and he's going to share with you some of his musical passions. So there's been such an amazing presentation so far. So I figured I would go in a slightly different area. You've learned so much about how to make an ocarina. You've learned about um, what's popular in, in, in Ocarina Land and, and at the conventions and from different glaze finishes and such. So I'm gonna dive right into some of the, the musical aspects of what's been inspiring me lately. As you know, a couple of years ago, I became interested in sound healing and the possibility of sound as being a, an experience that can actually transform your body, your mind, your soul, and as experience of uh, sound meditation, using sound to to heal, to find peace, to in, enhance your meditation. And in that regard, you've probably heard of binaural beats. And what is a beat? A beat is two frequencies that are close together. And they're so close together that instead of hearing a harmony, you hear like a, a fluttering or kind of a wave pattern. Uh, piano tuners use this beat to to tune a piano, there's a lot of compromises involved and they're listening for those, those beats at certain frequency of rhythmic 
a rhythmic frequency of beats allows you to tune a piano correctly, at least to equal temper. Um, they've discovered uh, about 30 years ago that beat frequencies can actually entrain your brain into reaching uh, states of mind that are closer to sleep or meditation, alpha, theta, and even delta waves. You can emulate those patterns. And so I'd like to share with you just a little bit of what I've been exploring in that realm and maybe it'll, it'll be interesting to you as well. So this is a kind of a gentle place to start with the two bass uh, ocarinas that are tuned uh, together in, in unison. And then with holes, instead of playing music with these holes, you use them to slightly modulate the frequency so you're, uh, you can modulate the beat between the two notes. Now, what happens with the beat as the notes are very close in unison together, a little bit off, you'll hear the third frequency or the beat frequency is the difference between those two tones. And as those tunes, those tones separate, the beat frequency will become higher and higher frequency. So let's say you're starting at two beats per minute and then it's uh, 10 and then it's 100. Well, by the time it gets to 100, then you start to hear it, or even like around 30 or 40, you start to hear it as a low bass note. As it gets higher, it becomes higher and higher until it, it's into, um, kind of a, a, a tenorish tone. And as the frequency between the two notes becomes like a fifth, then you're hearing a chord. And that third tone, which is the beat frequency, that's what you wanna pay attention to because it's the one that seems to stimulate or entrain your, your brain in such a way. Now, of course, it's, it's better in the, in the live uh, form. There's something about the organic sound of the pure sine wave frequencies coming off of an ocarina football that is, uh, has the most profound effect. There are, of course, uh, apps and uh, electronic versions of beat frequency generators. And in fact, I use one on my app that helps me go to sleep at night and creates a, a steady tone. There's something really special about creating it with your breath and the absolute pure frequencies that are happening from an organic instrument. And so we're all about the organic instruments and. Sometimes I joke and I say that the ocarina is a digital flute because you use your digits to play it. So with that in mind, here is what a beat frequency whistle sounds like, or at least an approximation through your, your speakers. I'm not sure how much of that comes through. If you get kind of a general idea, another advantage of doing this type of work is that doing a long breath really chills out your mind, the thinking. It's a, a form of, of yoga or meditation that's very, has a long and storied history in the East. And it is a very useful aid to reaching a more relaxed state of mind, especially if you're have some anxiety going on or a busy day, it's a good day to relax, good way to set your mind, shake your etch and sketch, so to speak, and start with a clean slate. So um, here is a version of it with a slightly higher frequency, it's a little bit more intense. And when I first introduce people to beat frequencies, I like to start with the bass one, it's very gentle. I'm still not sure how it translates through the, the Zoom call, but um, perhaps 
leave a comment and say, I didn't hear any B frequencies or I did. And uh, we'll take your feedback and maybe I'll, I'll switch to some other things if this isn't working. But here's, here's the next level of intensity. Now notice I am, um, I'm tuning the, the two chambers. Instead of playing musically or a binary on or off, I'm, it's kind of like tuning a radio, an old fashioned dial where you're turning it very fine and I'm, I'm listening for those B frequencies. Okay, here we go. I'll just do three breaths on this one. Sometimes I get carried away. feedback the high end is cutting out but the beginning is audible okay well in that case i won't even bother with my soprano model now this is the this is like instead of a sound bath this is taking a sound shower like a cold shower um won't even bother with this one it's probably not going to carry through i'll give you one too just just in case now this can be kind of intense if you are prone to epileptic seizures or have severe uh, ptsd around sirens you might want to mute your audio. So I'll give you a second to, to do that. If you're someone who um, uh, is prone to seizures, you might want to sit this one out. I'll just do one breath, okay? Just, just for fun, take a step back here. This is pretty intense. Wow, okay, now we did that, so interesting. So I began an exploration of interest in geometry and this is a dodecahedron. It's a 12-sided polyhedron where every angle is 60 degrees. There's 12 faces and I was curious what would uh, a sacred geometry or a platonic solid sound like as a resonating chamber? And I always remember the first time I I made one of these and I started playing it in the workshop and, and everyone who came by stopped and was like, whoa, what's that sound? Because it, it did have a unique timbre and the, a very nice resonance. So um, this is a sacred geometry ocarina and here's what it sounds like. of sacred geometry. So what's next? Oh, how about this little guy? So I wanted to see how small could I make an ocarina? And this is maybe not the, the smallest ocarina, but it's pretty tiny. And so when I made this one, it's a very cute little sound. And as I made this one, I noticed the birds started singing around me and I thought, I should make a bird caller, an instrument to tweet with the birds and have a interspecies communication device. And I thought, okay, well, how do I do that? Um, this is too small, it's not comfortable to hold. What if I make a very thick walled, larger ocarina with a tiny internal chamber, but a larger size on the outside? And thus the tweeter was born. So the walls are like that thick. And it's got this, these big holes so that you can modulate the sound without playing notes. So I didn't want it to be mistaken uh, for a musical instrument. I wanted to make sure that you were using it just as a way to communicate with the birds. And what I noticed was every time I would play this, 
the birds in the neighborhood would start chirping and one of two things happens. Either the birds start chirping or I notice the birds and I tune into the, the bird frequency. And, um, but I hear it from everyone, they're like, wait, does those birds just start singing? So I'm not sure, so I gotta do some double blind test, see if the birds do start singing or if I just start noticing them. But anyway, here's what the tweeter sounds like. So this has been fun. It's, it's great when I take it out of nature. I swear I've had some great conversations with birds. And I've gotten some great stories from people who are like made friends with their neighborhood birds who actually came up close and started um, becoming very curious what was going on over there. Um, what's next in Ocarina land? So another passion I have is ethnomusicology. You know, it's studying the music of different cultures. And I've had the great good fortune to travel to some countries where I love their music and I was able to study music with, with local people, villagers in their huts, learning folk music in, in the deserts of India and in uh, remote villages in Turkey with, um, with old men who lived in, in little huts and played uh, their flutes and in various places around the Middle East. I've got to study in Egypt and in the desert of Israel, and in, uh, where else have I been? Um, also in Italy. <laughs> and so it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's such a, a fascinating world of music out there. And it's, it's so gratifying and fun to learn music from, from someone and, and, and learn their folk songs. And wow, what a passport is music. And you can come into a, a, a village or a town, hear a song on the radio, figure it out, on your ocarina and the next thing you know people are inviting you home for dinner and want to share with you their music it, it is it's so deeply nourishing on a, on a soulful level so i've just started making ocarinas that are specialized in various keys now my first one that i made like this after traveling to costa rica and seeing some local ocarinas there and i saw that they they were tuned in a almost minor pentatonic scale where the first three holes are about the same size they go up a minor third and then the last the second two hole the fourth and fifth holes are larger and they bring you up to an octave and i was like wow that's brilliant and so i took that idea and started making minor pentatonic styles let's see i think i have one right here and so the minor pentatonic is really lovely because uh you know it's like there's no wrong notes every combination sounds good and so it's it's a very easy for beginners who are just gonna just start throwing their fingers around and everything's gonna sound pleasing and harmonic. Although, you know, people will manage to find a, a way to make some things sound harmonic. It's, it's about as close as you can get as an idiot proof ocarina, but. It's also the scale of the Native American flute, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it's also the Japanese shakuhachi flute, so it, it really spans the globe as a, as, a, as a cherished scale, and so I've had fun making flutes in the minor pentatonic scale. Um, okay, so what is next would be one in the harmonic minor scale. So the harmonic minor scale is the scale known as hijaz, and it is a very popular scale from Morocco all the way up to Turkey, all through around the Mediterranean. And this is the snake charmer scale. And actually, funny story, I used to sell ocarinas on the beach in Santa Barbara on a weekly uh, show that, that caters to people visiting Santa Barbara, the lovely beaches and mountain town of Santa Barbara. And so I had a, a stall there for many years. and one of the things after the hundredth person said to me, where's your snake? And so I made a, I got a basket about this tall, I cut a hole in the bottom of it. I cut a hole in the table and under the table, I got an, a car antenna rigged up to a car battery and a, and a foot switch that could make the antenna go up and down. And I attached a puppet of a snake that I had got in India years before. And so what I could do is with the flip of the switch, I could make the snake rise up out of the basket and then with my knee, I could kind of make it go side to side. 
while I'm playing the ocarina. And as soon as that snake would pop up, people would jump back and scream in the bottom of the bathroom. It was a whole lot of fun. Those were some good old days. I miss those days. But anyway, um, that is the harmonic minor, and it's also known as he jazz. And so just this week, I thought, okay, well, I've got he jazz. That's a lovely one. And here it would sound like on a, on a tenor, a little bit deeper sound. So what happened there was I started improvising and after a few seconds of improvising, uh, a tune uh, welled up out of somewhere and it reminded me of those notes and a song that I hadn't played or remembered in many, many moons and it just popped up and I love how songs bubble up out of an improvisation. So a lot of times I'll just start improvising and then I'm like, oh yeah, and I know so many songs, but they're not in my... Uh, my random access memory. They, they're, they're in my very random access memory. Yeah, read-only memory. They're deep in there somewhere and they, they have to bubble out. They're called forth by uh, a, a situation or an improvisation or a request. And so that song is from Armenia. I don't remember the name of it, but I've heard it. And I learned it a long time ago and, and they, I love how songs bubble up. I have a vast library of songs and sometimes you just need a catalyst to, to bring them up. So, that brings me to a flute that I just made this week that is in another scale from the Middle East, and this is known as Saba. And Saba is a scale that we played early in the morning, just uh, around sunrise, and it's a very meditative mode. And this one, I made a special addition to the mouthpiece where I, I put a, a hood over the mouthpiece to kind of... Uh, shade the sound a little bit and give it a kind of a breathy, sandy tone. I learned this trick when I was in Armenia where the, um, I had a, a fiddle flute and the, the gentleman who was, who was the, the grand wazoo of this instrument, he got a Coke bottle, uh, the little plastic ring that, that you discard as you open the, the cap and he slid it over and blocked part of the, the windway or part of the fiddle. And so I created a little hood here to, to block the, partially and so what it does is it, get, it adds an element of breath and there's an instrument in the Middle East called the ney. The ney is just a tube of reed and it's an inblown flute and they, they consider the breath to be an, an essential ingredient of the sound unlike a traditional ocarina or a, a recorder where you're going for that super pure sound, you're going for a more uh, windy sand swept sound and so that's what I was going for when this one and literally just pulled this out of the kiln on Friday. So I'm um, excited. I, I got excited last night. I, I, I have a, a stairwell in the building that I live in and the acoustics are really great. And I go there at, late at night and, um, and jam out. And I'm always in search for great acoustics. So I'm walking down the street and I see a, a parking garage or a stairwell and I'll, I'll, I'll just hop in and, and play whatever I have in my pocket or I'm wearing at the time. And it's always a fun moment until someone comes in and goes, what's going on in here? But it usually works out pretty good. All right, this is Saba. And you'll notice it's a very exotic sounding scale. And this is a specialized flute. It only does Saba. There's not really any uh, cross fingering opportunities. So it's, it's one of these specialized. And I figured, you know, um, an ocarina that you can play chromatic and you can play all the, all the notes of the scale, that's really great and really useful. And I figured looking at the popularity of the handpan world, and where hand pans are each 
in one individual tuning and they only do one thing, but they do it really well. And ocarinas are kind of the, uh, the hand pan of the, of the flute world. And so I figured, well, I can specialize and make flutes that just do one, one thing and do it really well. So here's Saba. But you know, for this one, I think we should go in the hallway, get a little bit of reverb in, in, our, in our hallway here between the office and the workshop. Got a little bit better acoustic. So let's go in here. Is this interesting for you guys? You bored or is this fun? All right, well, Eric can see what your response. If you're bored, then we'll, we'll jump ahead. It's so fun, fun. Okay, cool. All right, so here's uh, Saba. I interrupt this musical interlude to tell you one thing. There's a note in here that's not on the Western scale. It's not on the piano. It's in between the E and the F. It's called uh, E half flat. And a half flat, it's not actually half flat. It's about 33 cents flat off of the E natural. And so it's known as a half flat. No, it's not actually E. It would be if you were in the key of C. So it's the third is uh, slightly flat. And so see if you can hear what note that is, the one that's that's off the chart, so to speak, but it's it's such it's so characteristic of music of this region of the world. So back to the music. Saba and hot out of the kiln. Still a little bit warm. Not really. So that is, you know, is that interesting for y'all? All right, what's next? Okay. Um, this is a new shape. This was, um, you know, we also get requests, and I love requests. We're like, hey, can you make one like from the song from the sea? Make one like a seashell. So this is a, a prototype of a seashell shaped. Ocarina, and I think we are going to get into making seashell shaped ocarinas. And I thought of, of a great name for it last night. I'm going to call it Michelle. So, anyway, this is Michelle. And I think I'm going to make a, a, a deeper one, maybe in, in the key of tenor F. So, there's that one. All right, moving right along. Let's do a uh, crystal light up ocarina. All right, here's another one fresh out of the kiln. I'm really, this was also a commission. Someone's like, can you make me one that is in a kind of a lighter color with the crystal that lights up according to the frequency of the tone. So this one's in G and it's also tuned in the minor pentatonic scale. And I've been having fun with um, 
getting a fipple sound. Now that's a real crystal, a real quartz crystal. And the color of the crystal is gonna light up to the frequency of the note. And this is something that we've, we're very excited about, a synesthetic experience of music. And according to several synesthetes that I've encountered with this, they're, they're very impressed at, the, at the, the accuracy of tone. Even though people have different colors associated with different frequencies, uh, the experience is, is similar. rainbow up from red. Red to red. I chose G to be red and A to be A, or orange to be A, and C of green, and then D is blue. So anyway, it is going up built from the key of G. Now here's a larger and denser version of the same thing and it's fun to play with um, different tubular sizes. I've been really um, curious about tubular, the tubular sound. So it's, it's like an ocarina uh, mouthpiece but in an open tube and so here's how this one sounds. Okay, inspirations. Who has seen the dark crystal? The dark crystal. So the original one that came out when I was a little boy, I was like the perfect target demographic for the Henson's uh, version of, well, even the new one is a Henson version of the dark crystal. And who's seen the new one? Um, it's absolutely amazing. Totally holds true to the spirit of the original. And so in it, in the, like one of the very first scenes, um, there's a scene in a, in a little canoe, in a little rowboat, and, and Jen is playing a, a double flute, double pipes. And I, in honor of that, I, I made this um, double chamber tuned in octaves, uh, harmony double. So. a magical sound and I love getting the overtones of the harmonies correct and it creates a whole chord and there's even like four tones there's an upper harmonic and a lower harmonic so I love fine tuning in until we get those harmonics in tune and then you're playing a whole chord which is two notes and so with that I think we're going to bring our master multi multi-chamber ocarinist into the mix and I'm going to take over the camera duties and Eric 
my office elf and now ocarina making elf because he's made his first batch of ocarinas just this past two weeks. Very excited about that. He's going to take over and demonstrate some multi-chamber prowess. Okay, so here we go. Hey, I'm Eric, and yes, I love multi-chamber ocarinas, and I'd like to tell you a little bit, just a story of how I came to fall so in love with the Songbird multi-chamber. So this is the Songbird Triple Harmony Ocarina. And how did I come to fall in love with this? Let me just tell you briefly the story of how I got into ocarina in the first place. So I've always been into very unusual musical instruments. I grew up actually studying the bagpipe, which I play professionally, both the Scottish bagpipe and the Irish Island bagpipe. And I just love exploring unusual musical sounds. Ocarina too, I was a Zelda fan. I played Ocarina of Time, et cetera, growing up. And I always thought, you know, maybe I'll buy an Ocarina someday, but I'm also a very frugal person. I don't like to spend money. So I thought, you know, I don't want to buy an Ocarina. It costs a lot of money, right? But one day I found this $5 cheap plastic garbage Ocarina on the street in LA. It was around the street and I thought, why not? It's $5, I'll buy it. So I got this plastic Ocarina. I figured it out in the day and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Maybe I'll actually get a real Ocarina. So then I finally actually first encountered Songbird Ocarina at Anime Expo later that year. And I found out, hey, there's this business called Songbird Ocarina. It's right here in LA. And at that point, I already picked up a few smaller Alto C Ocarinas. And I thought, I want to get something a little bit more practical, a little bit I can do a little bit more with. So I came to Songbird Ocarina for the first time. And I thought, I'm just going to buy like a base Ocarina or maybe a double chamber Ocarina to extend my range. But then I found this one, the Triple Harmony Ocarina. And what's really interesting about this ocarina, it was actually a collaboration that when David Ramos was working more closely with Sombra Ocarina, and he wanted to make a multi-chamber ocarina following the structure of Giorgio Pacchioni, who makes beautiful, amazing multi-chamber ocarinas. And Pacchioni, he makes it with the second chamber rather than picking up after the E flat into an E natural, as many other multi-chambers do. He starts again on C. So the fingering is parallel between the first and second chambers. You have C, D, E, F, G. CDFG, which to me, it was just much more natural to encounter this fingering. And then the third chamber, Pacchioni actually makes it with the, his third chamber. He starts on F, he goes F, G, A, B flat, C, which I'm not sure why he does that, honestly, but David Ramos, he was thinking it would make more sense to start again on G, G, A, B, C, D. And this also made more sense to me because the even the mix like orchestral string instruments, which in which the strings are arranged in fifths. So for example, a violin, you have your C string within your G string. So it just was a very natural intuitive pattern. And I realized, wow, that, like this instrument, like how many wind instruments can you play chords of three notes on one instrument? Like I'd never experienced that before and I was so excited. And even though I only wanted to spend like a hundred dollars max that day, I came in, the price was like $250, but I had an epiphany that day and I realized this is the reason God invented money. It's, it's the bio greenness. <laughs> so I'm just going to play, play a little piece on this triple green. So you can see some of the harmonic capabilities. That's why I love this ocarina. It can do so much. And I really enjoy just the challenge of trying to arrange a piece that will fit across the chambers, get the chords to fit together. There's a lot you can do to do the overlap in the notes among the chambers, as opposed to maybe the more common multi-chambers in which the chambers are arranged linearly. So that's the Songbird Harmony Triple. Another less common, less well-known multi-chamber ocarina that we have, we call this the Lovebirds. And we've made a few different variations of these. So it's two chambers. The first one is a little bit deeper, obviously, and we've experimented with arranging them in fourths or fifths or thirds. This particular one, the chambers are separated by fourths. And here's what this one sounds like.
can get this as well. And that's that's also one of the even main reasons why I became so attracted to Sampo Ocarina is just the innovation that exists here. There's instruments that you can't find anywhere else. I mean, even the synesthesia ocarinas that you saw, the synesthesia flutes, like that's just so amazing and beautiful because it adds a whole another dimension of light, visual beauty that corresponds with the music that you hear. And even when the when the synesthesia ocarina first came out, the ocarina of light, I remember I was so excited. Durian was only releasing about like 10 of them on the first release. And I was there on my laptop, like ready to buy it and check out, but I actually missed it because everyone bought them within like a minute before I could check out the first time. Then a couple weeks later, I tried again, he released the next batch. And I was actually just around the corner at the Starbucks. I was ready to check out and I got it this time. So the second batch, I bought it at the Starbucks. I walked over to Samba and like, hey Durian, I'm here. I just bought your synesthesia over in LA. And I was so excited just to be able to experience so many of the different musical magic opportunities that exist here. And that's really the magic of Sombra Ocarina too, is just exploring new worlds, surpassing the horizons of music and seeing, seeing what we can make to really and truly make music a magical experience. Oh, thank you, Eric. Inspiring. Uh, a quick story about Eric. So when he first uh, applied to work here, I was uh, looking for a, a new office elf. Uh, I didn't know I wanted an office elf. I thought I was just going for an office manager, but I got an extra, um, extra bonus on that one. Uh, when Eric applied, he had also gotten a scholarship to go to Korea and study and teach English as a, as a, a Korean speaker because he had learned Korean in school. And so I told him, well, maybe you should go ahead and do that and, and instead of working here. And he's like, no, I'd rather work at Songbird Ocarina. And I'm like, no, you should go and do this, the scholarship. And uh, uh, a couple weeks later, he let me know that the, the scholarship was a a, a non-financial scholarship, just uh, an opportunity to go there. And he's like, you know, I'd, I actually really rather work at Songbird Ocarina. And so I'm like, all right, come on. And the very next week, his very first week of starting to work, a, a Korean ocarina maker came to town and wanted to visit. And uh, and Eric was able to speak to him in, in Korean. So I knew it was a it was a sign that that, that it was good timing. And, and he's been a, an amazing Edition. He's the one who answers the phone and answers your questions and emails, and he's so knowledgeable uh, about everything ocarina and music that on day one that he started working here, uh, he never had to ask me any question about the ocarina models, uh, which keys they're in, what what they pair well with, and he could describe them in the same way you would describe a fine wine. And so it's just been amazing working with Eric. And as you see, he he came in on a Saturday, even though um, there's no uh, official work today. So he's very, his, his dedication runs deep because he loves the ocarina as much as any of us do. And that's, uh, that's very special. And he shows up consistently and, and just loves the work. So it's, it's great. And I always hear amazing music coming from, from up front here. And so that's always encouraging. I'm like, oh, wow, what, what ocarina is that? <laughs> that sounds great. So anyway, I think we're open to questions now, if you have any, any questions for us. So hit us up and we'll see if we can answer your burning inquiries. Durian, I have a super quick request of you. I know that I played one of STL's Ocarina. Can I play one of yours before we answer questions? Can you hear me okay? Sure. You want me to play one or you're going to play one? Um, I was He's asking if I could play your Ocarina. Well. Well. Oh, Just because sure. I recently bought this one and I'm really in love with it. Cool. Wow. Really enjoyed getting this one. And it, it's just super cool, the technology that Durian has been able to use to make these pitches uh, be able to light up. Super duper cool. Um, so Durian, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, the questions that I have here from um, a few people. Um, so uh, we have a question on the question and answer panel. We have a, uh, somebody who asks, is the ocarina tree still in the workshop? <laughs> Oh yeah, you want to see? Let's go over to the ocarina tree. Here's our ocarina tree. Now we do have a shop here. If you're ever if you're ever in Los Angeles, uh, we love to give tours. 
We'll show you where all the magic gets made. You can come see the ocarina tree and just come and shoot right off of it. So over in, in here in sunny Los Angeles, ocarinas do grow on trees. And so, and we have ocarinas coming out of our ears. So you're welcome to come here and check out our ocarinas and we'll give you a tour. And here you can sign our, our guest book. Here, let's, let's sign the guest book. Um, Ocarina Festival 2020. Loves everything. Ocarina. Well, there you have it, guys. Now we've signed one book next to the Ocarina tree. That's awesome. Thank you for the question. That was a great question. Wow. Would you look at that? <laughs> All right. What's next? All right. We have a really good question. And I, I was thinking of asking this question. So I'm so happy somebody asked it. Um, uh, my friend Stefan, who is very much into Sampoña, Ken, Kena, and other music from South America asks, uh, have you visited South America and had experience with Andean music? Mm. Uh, the closest I've come is Costa Rica. So I've been to Central America and I'm very, oh, wait, I've been to Colombia. And about a week in Colombia, and I, the closest I found to an ocarina in Colombia was a, a PVC saxophone that, that a gentleman was making on the street that of course I had to buy, <laughs> um, as all the musical tourists do. And so I'm look, very much looking forward to an Andean adventure, visiting Peru and hearing the uh, whistling vessels in person, maybe visiting some workshops and, and doing a deep dive. I also hear that there are some workshops um, that are centered around healing and music that happened down there uh, on Lake Guatemala, not exactly in South America. But I'm very much looking forward to uh, an Indian musical adventure in, um, in Ecuador, who I'm hoping to visit uh, sometime in the not too distant future. So thanks for that inspiration. And yeah, as soon as uh, things are looking up, actually I do have a, a trip planned um, into Patagonia in December, there's a full solar eclipse happening and that's in the, in the path of totality where the eclipse of the sun is total. Now it's around the winter solstice. I have a feeling it's not gonna happen, so I'm not holding my breath, but that was my intention to go down to Patagonia in Argentina, but it's on my to-do list. Thank you for your answer, Dorian. Really appreciate it. Some of uh, the ocarinas that you were showing reminded me of the kenas that they play in South America. And they do, just for your information, uh, have a kena festival over there every year, uh, similar to the ocarina festival, uh, because they have a very thriving kena community. And kena is a, a round flute that doesn't have a, a, a fipple or uh, the wind way that we call it. Instead, like it's kind of like the round flute that you were showing uh, that just you have to do a mouth shape to get the sound. It's, it's really interesting, but- uh, I, have a, I have a brief little kind of story for you. <gasps> so it was my birthday and I was sitting at my window at night and just having an, enjoying the cool summer breeze when I heard from the distance, the beautiful flute playing, some of the most beautiful flute playing I've heard in a long time. And I just sat there for about a half an hour listening to it. And then I'm like, I've got to go out there and find this, this player, they're so good. And so I went outside and found between two large buildings, each one building was about eight stories and the other building was about five stories. And there was about a 50 foot space between them. There's a gentleman there with, with a cana and he had long curly black hair and he was like, looked like a kind of a skater kid. And he was playing a cana and the echo between the two buildings was so beautiful and he was so good. And I, and I, I uh, as I came up to him, he's like, oh, well, here, you know, and I, I showed him my ocarina and I played for him and I ended up giving him the one that I was wearing. Um, and he was so grateful. He gave me his numbers. He says, well, listen, let me take you up into the San Gabriel Mountains. There's a place 
there's a trail that I know that is goes above the clouds. And as you play, the sound echoes off of the cloud bank and you get this beautiful sound that you don't get anywhere else. I'm still looking forward to going on that, that hike with him. So that's my Kana story. Apparently his, um, his Kana he had gotten from a master and, uh, and he had a whole story around it. There's a whole world, a whole Kana world. And it's, it's an in-notched flute. It's kind of the shakuhachi of, of South America. Excuse that reference, that's probably, there's probably a lot of Japanese people just got pissed off right now. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, to my um, un, still uncivilized mind, uh, that's how I saw it. But Kana is a whole world and thank you for uh, inspiring me. I look forward to a, a deep dive into the, the Kana one of these days. Absolutely, Durian. Uh, everybody, please show Durian uh, how much we appreciate that he took the time and also Eric that they took the time to come show us the ocarinas from Songbird Ocarina. Uh, let me pull up their code real quick so I can share that with everybody. Uh, that was a lot of work. Please say thank you to both of them. Um, so their code is going to be for the festival Ocarina Fest, all in caps. And they have a discount code throughout the entire weekend uh, for 15% off of their session. And I'm very, very excited. Uh, so hopefully you guys take advantage of that. Um, I'll be posting Ocarina Caro, SGLs, and Songbirds Ocarina's codes on the Facebook webpage uh, right now. And I'll take a moment to post them in the chat. So please be sure to say thank you to Songbird and to Eric and say bye to them as well because our session is just finished. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Durian. Thanks, Eric. See y'all later. Bye. Bye. I'm going to take a moment just to uh, make sure that I type these in the chat for anybody that is leaving right before I leave. Um, but man, that was a cool session. I'm so excited about that. So hang on just a moment. Bear with me and I'll get you all these codes as soon as possible. Alrighty, y'all. I don't know about you, but after I finish closing this session up, I'm probably going to go ocarina shopping once I'm done uh, posting all these codes. So please be sure to support our makers. It's really important to make to help and make our community grow to support our ocarina makers and our ocarina companies. And thanks again for being a part of this panel to everybody. And thanks everybody that came to our panel and to our session on the virtual ocarina makers exchange, our first virtual ocarina makers exchange. And we will see you at the concert tonight at 744, starting with, um, I believe Jordan Moore's performance, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, please join us. We have Jordan Moore, we have uh, Yoko Kawamoto, we have Ryoko Sakura, and we also have Milt Ocarina, which I'm so excited about. So thank you guys so much, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.